Okay, well, welcome to uh, AASL. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're here with uh, Dana uh, Boyd, and we have a few questions to ask her before she uh, presents the keynote address at the uh, annual conference. Um, social media and schools, you know, do you have any suggestions on how we can convince uh, schools to incorporate social media, media into the uh, curriculum? Sure. Well, I mean, part of it is starting by accepting that social media is a part of kids' lives uh, and stopping blocking it. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. We think of curriculum typically in this very formalistic math, uh, reading, writing types of things, science. But there's actually a whole set of learning that goes on in social media already, very informal learning that we often don't take into account when we think about it. Um, so things like how do you understand your peers in the social world around you? How do you actually learn to interact with other people and learn to read the, you know, the impressions that they're giving off and make sense of uh, social interactions. We, we bake this into the curriculum in really funny ways, right? Collaborative e efforts, right? And exercises that we have. But in some ways, we actually have to help young people work through their engagement already with social media before we even take it into the classroom, per se. Now, in terms of actual stuff, the first point of um, uh, change that can happen very easily is actually incorporating Wikipedia into the classroom. And I say this because Wikipedia ends up filling out a whole set of topics we talk about in the classroom more generally, and it makes visible the creation of that content. And what it means is that we can actually educate young, um, young people to think about the content creation process. And so, you know, an example that I, I like to give um, Take an average history class where we're talking about the American Revolution, right? I love the American Revolution uh, Wikipedia pages. Why? Because it has to resolve to English. It has to resolve in a way that works for both the Brits and the Americans. And they actually fought it out, right? They, they disagreed because their history books told two very different stories. Um, as my family learned, my, my grandfather came over and tore up my mother's um, history textbook because he was so offended that this American textbook was wrong, wrong, wrong to his British you know, feelings about the world. Well, what happens when we can see that dialogue, we see that disagreement, where we think about how history is narrated? That becomes part of the curriculum directly. And so part of it is take these information technologies and put them in first, while also teaching the social media, or teaching young people to make sense of the social media that they're already inhabiting. Any advice for parents in dealing with uh, their children and social media? Conversation. The absolute key to, to healthy interaction online is, is to have a healthy everyday conversation with your, with your children. Talk, to talk about them, talk with them about what they're doing, what they're seeing, how they're thinking about it. And it's not something that you can start in high school when they're getting onto these, into these systems. It's something you start from a very young age. You ask them about the interactions that they have with their peers, whether they're mediated or not. And you start to help them think through those kinds of interactions. You become the per person that they turn to when, they, when they don't understand something where they're frustrated, where they're hurt, where something seems really wrong. Um, and then technology becomes part of their lives in a way where you also work through and think about it there. But to assume that we can just talk about the technology misses the broader picture. And all too often, parents think that the technology is totally new and means that their kids' lives are totally new. In fact, the same issues have been playing out for, for generation after generation. It's just playing out in slightly, it's just being inflected in slightly different ways now. Well, that's my next question. Can you give us an example in history of a phenomenon like social uh, social networking uh, that uh, you know has you know that is common day today. Well, uh, thinking of it as you know the tele the introduction of the telephone into a household was a really radical thing as well. The idea of being able to talk to your friends when they weren't in the same in the same physical space was like was really shocking. You know, and it became this big balance in history of like. Well, the, when you're home, you're supposed to be with a family. You're not supposed to be talking to your friends. And, and there were all sorts of battles that played out, right? Like, do you take a phone call during dinner? Gasp, that's horrible, right? And these disruptions, how late are you allowed to be on the phone with your friends? And what we saw with the introduction of the telephone into the household was the importance of people talking to their, their peers. Social media and the social network sites are playing out the same story again, another iteration of it. But we, at this point, we take the idea of calling for granted, and we've reached a balanced set of norms. Right? They're still negotiated. Right? Maybe the the rule isn't to take the the phone calls during dinner. You know, maybe there's a, a, a time at, at night when no more phone calls are allowed. You know, we will reach these same balances with social media. Uh, but the, the thing is, is that parents grew up with phones. Parents didn't grow up with social network sites. Right, and um, looking to the future, uh, do you, uh, what do you see on the horizon uh, as the 
next generation of uh, social networking and media. The big pressure point at this point is everything will go mobile. Right? And, and we don't know what it will play out because in some ways the technology is there but the barriers around economics and the carriers are what's really constraining a whole lot of innovation. And so what happens is that you've got you know, a Blackberry, I've got an iPhone, you're on Verizon, I'm on AT&T, we can't actually communicate with one another. That's going to get worked out in the next couple of years. And young people are then going to have a handheld with them at all times, and not just for text messaging and phone calls, but for a whole variety of different interactions that include location-based interactions, that include making sense of their peer groups, that they're going to be always connected in a totally new way. We've already seen signs of it with text messaging, but it's really going to break through in new ways very shortly. Uh, do you see a sexual uh, divide in social uh, networking? The main th in terms of boys and girls. Right, yes. The main thing is the same dynamics as always, right? Which is that the girls are much more social, much more working out of popularity at a younger age than the boys. The boys are much more activity driven, like how do we you know, do this, whatever. Um, their engagement with it tends to be a lot more functional, um, a lot more, you know, how do I do this t new technology, piece these things together. The girls are much more likely to be doing the, the updating all the time and the mm. really hyper social components of it. But the participation, you know, they're both participating but in slightly different ways ways and it's very much similar to the same stories of gender differences that we've seen long before um, social media was in play. And uh, any, uh, well what role do you see school librarians uh, playing in uh, the uh, incorporating social uh, media into, into schools? Right. I mean, the thing is, school librarians, better than anybody else, know how to think about information and to think about the structures and privacy and all of these issues that they've been working out for a very long time. They can actually help young people make sense of these things. And they're, they play a different role than the teacher in that they're not there to assign a task, but they can help young people think through it. And they can be a really critical adult to help them make sense of the world around them, to make sense of the mediated technology, um, to the degree that they understand it and are embracing it. But part of it is this beautiful dynamic dynamic, right? Young people come, they know how to use the technology, and now we have to think about the librarians who, who understand the broader structures, right? They have an infrastructure in their mind, and it becomes a conversation, and that's a really powerful opportunity for all sorts of education on both sides. Right. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your time with us, and I'm looking forward to the uh, keynote address. Thanks. Thank you very much.